Everybody? Yeah. yeah. Good? Okay. Well, uh, first off, I want to say thanks, guys, for everybody showing up. Uh, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started with prayer. Okay. Dear Lord, uh, we just, uh, what can we say? Uh, what is there to say? You've just done the impossible. Um, your word is just so such a strong love story that it's hard to even think about. But Lord, thank you so much that you deal with us in our uh, little minds and little world, and you loved us anyways. In your name, amen. Amen. Okay, well, first off, you guys, uh, it seems like the topic is great since every song we just sang about is uh, exactly that. Uh, I want to, before we do any, well, actually, I'll come back then. Uh, so tonight I'm going to talk to you about this topic, and we've all heard the word before grace. Uh, it's something that, you know, you hear in sermons, you read about in the Bible, but uh, I love stories. I was a history major in college, and so tonight we'll just be doing some stories. So the first one is there was a woman named Corrie Ten Boom who, during the Second World War, she, uh, she had a terrible experience in the Nazi German, basically a Nazi Germany concentration camp. She, uh, being the Christian that she was, she would take in Jews, even though she wasn't Jewish, in, um, in the Netherlands. And that was obviously an illegal activity by the German occupation. And so her and the rest of her family were put into these death camps, if you will. And uh, during her experience, Corrie Ten Boom found herself standing face to face with one of the most cruel and heartless German guards at the facility she was at. And that she'd ever met in the camps. It was just brutal, and the conditions were this man had actually humiliated and degraded her, both her and her sister, Betsy. He was jeering at them and visually raping them as they stood in the delousing shower naked and, and vulnerable to so many horrible things. Well, the interesting thing is, funny thing, God works in mysterious ways. Years later, after she was miraculously released from these camps, this uh, German officer that was brutal to her and, and uh, uh, unspeakable. He stood before her with an outstretched hand as a Christian asking, will you forgive me? And uh, Corey said, I stood there with coldness clutching at my heart, but I know that the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. I pray Jesus help me. Woodingly, mechanically, I thrust my hand to, into the one stretched out towards me, and I experienced an incredible thing. The current started in my shoulder and raced down my arm and sprang into our clutched hands. Then this warm reconciliation seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother. I cried with my whole heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard, the former prisoner, together. I have never known the love of God so intensely as I did in that moment. When we forgive, we set a prisoner free, and of course, that's ourselves. Now, the question is, is who can do that in their own strength? If you put yourself in her shoes, could you honestly go to a man that, that you may have had countless sinful thoughts about and go and say, I forgive you, brother? Well, obviously, that's something that we couldn't do by ourselves. So to me, that's a great illustration of what grace looks like to open. Of course, I'm was a tremendous author and died uh, about 20 years ago, and that's just the example. Now, thinking about that, you've heard the phrase before, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that's something that I always stuck in my mind. But you know, the verse goes on to say after that, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And again, Corrie Ten Boom in her own strength, she wouldn't have been able to do that, but this allowed her to do that. Now, that being the case, many of us have heard this before. We've taken the call to Christ and said, yes, Lord, I'm going to bow my knee to you, repent and turn and follow you. But how do we respond to that? Do we just stop there? Or is there something more? Well, what I thought we could talk about, first off, is what grace should not look like. So if you would be so kind as to turn to your Bibles, to the book of Matthew, chapter 18. And we're going to just read verses 23 thir through 35. Okay. All right. Okay. So, disciples are asking Jesus, how many times should I forgive my brother? And Jesus says 70 times 7. So a lot, countless. And Jesus says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Now, uh, just to be clear, that when I've done a little reading on this, that was about a million dollars, if you look at the contrast. A million dollars the servant owes his king. 
Now, since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. Now, you can imagine, the servant is, is pleading. He says, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. A million dollars, by the way. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii, which is about the equivalent of $2, if I'm not mistaken. So, of course, being very unmerciful, he grabbed him, this fellow servant, and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the ser servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had the mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now think about that. This man was forgiven a great debt, something that he would never be able to pay back. He was given the opportunity to do it. He said, I would, be pay, I would pay it back freely without the torture. The master said, I forgive you. In his heart, he did not see that the way he should have. And of course, the master was furious. Now this man is in torture as an illustration from a separation from God. This man will never be able to pay back it because he's unable to work. He's going to be tortured until he pays it back and he'll never be able to do that. Now, what does that mean for us? Grace should not look like this ungratefulness. It should mean that we are all freed from debt, that we are free to not be in bondage. And thinking about this, what, what does that mean if, if this was applied to the world? How, how would this look? We're talking about things like no abortion, no broken marriages, no theft, no lying, no cheating, no slavery, no prejudice, no sin. Because when you have grace in your heart, you treat others differently. There's a change. And unfortunately, this man did not have it. Now, that being the case, we know that most people aren't going to go on the street and grab their fellow servant and say, pay me back what you do. But even so, what do you think grace should look like? So the next passage is we want to visit our friend Zacchaeus. Go to Luke 19. You guys are doing a great job. Thank you, everybody, for turning there. Okay, so we'll read verses 1 through 10. Again, what should grace look like? Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Now when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. Immediately, I must stay at your house. So he came down and went at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times the amount. Now, reading that, Zacchaeus was changed. He was moved by the master to change his life. He was willing to give up to four times of what he owed. And uh, this just means that Zacchaeus, you know, he was humble and inwardly convicted to do what is right. Somebody didn't force that upon him, but it was a change of heart. Comparing that with what we just saw with the ungrateful servant, when grace plays a part, you will be changed inwardly, and it shows externally. The next example or case is in Luke chapter 7. All right, starting in verse 36. So this is called Jesus anointed by a sinful woman. Now one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Then a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. And she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood before him at his feet weeping, she began to wet her feet with his tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. 
And when the Pharisees who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Jesus said, two men owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, and he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who has the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and at, said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I can't, this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a, t a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not pour oil on my head, but she had poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who has been forgiven little loves little. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Okay, so thinking about this, and honestly, how many of us would be willing to do that? You have this man here, and, and this is the Savior. But you bend down, and, and maybe this is more applicable to women, but you take your hair, and you start washing this man's dirty feet from the road, and unspeakable things. You don't just do that. Something changes in your life where you recognize that there is a Savior in front of you, that this is not just a ritual. This is something that she did that was very personal. Now, that in mind, do you think she was thinking about herself when this happened? Do you think she was thinking about her, her well-being? Of course not. Grace is not about you or me. It's about Christ and what he has done. Now, considering these examples I've just given you, you know, all these things happened before Christ was crucified. We think so often about the cross that Jesus died on and the, and the pain that he went through. But if these people are seeing this before he died, how much more should we recognize how much grace that we need, that we are, we are helpless without it? Now, you know, and I, always, I like to say, how thankful should we be? because we have been given this free gift of grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of yourself. Now, for the non-Christians out there, this is being recorded, my, my message to you is to come out of the shadows, come to the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting for you to come home. He bore your sins. He loved you. He died for you. And again, if these people who thought themselves not worthy but saw the, ris the Savior before he died, God is just as loving now. He even loves you more that he did do those things. Now, for the Christian, for us, for those of us who say we are children of God, cast your worth on the grace of Christ. You know what? And put your strength in him, not in yourself. And I, I like to say it's without him like carrying an elephant. I've never met one man to do it. No one can do it. It's impossible. Now, uh, last passage we'll turn to is Romans 4. If you want to turn there very quickly. Okay. Okay, Romans 4 verse Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. We read that earlier this week in our uh, Thursday group, and to me it was profound because, as I understand it, try living by the law. Observe what they did in the Old Testament. Observe those uh, people who... In the New Testament, Paul is striving to say, fall on the altar of grace. They are trying to follow the letter of the law perfectly to the T's, um, dotting their I's and crossing their T's. And you, that's fine. You can go down that road. But where does it end up with? You work as a man works, but his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. You know, you're really making it hard on yourself. When Jesus came and died for you and says, by grace are you saved through faith, now, a caveat with that, what is, does that mean that we just live our lives the way we want? 
No, certainly not. If these people who are willing to debase themselves, wash Jesus, count themselves unworthy, give away their wealth like Zacchaeus, if they were willing to have a change of heart and an outward expression of that change, who are we to be any different? Now, Paul, now, Paul also said, spoke of being weak so that Christ may be strong. You know, are we any different? Are we worthy to think that we are out of line with that? No. No, following Christ might be the biggest change and challenge in your life because you never, you never walk with Christ and are not changed. You're always going to be affected by who he is. And that being said, it's totally worth it. So if you're thinking about weighing the cost, yes, go count the cost, but the altar of grace is there. He died for you so that you could just come to him and say, Lord, please forgive me. Let me come and trust you. And again, if people were doing this before he died, I don't see why it should be any different now. Now, the last thing is I think we all understand that we be, should be showing grace to God and humility. But what about to each other? We can go and say that we love God all we want, sing the songs, and walk out the door, as I have done myself, and shrug people or acted in a way that was not humble. So the simple message is, is that we should love God and that we should love others, and it's by showing some grace. You know, there's somebody in your life that you know, everybody has a, a bubble, and you bump into other people's bubbles. When you walk and meet with somebody this week, what is your relationship with them, and are you really thinking about them as somebody that you would care about? Because we have all these people that we have small talk with, but what kind of impact do we have on their lives? Are we praying for them, reaching out to them, and, and representing them in the way that Christ would have us represent? So I count myself no better because I, uh, this week, was definitely dealing with that on a more materialistic sense, and I think it's something, the beauty of grace is that it never ends, is we can come in a week, you know, first week in January, we'll have an amazing week following God in the word and prayer. And the next week, you, uh, you learn that your taxes, you just filed them and you have a rough week. So, but, you know, and, or if we do something and we say the wrong thing to a family member or something, you know, God doesn't give up on us. And all the more, we just shouldn't give up on each other. So, the last thing, and so I guess in, in summation of all this, it's interesting because... I haven't experienced most of the things that I've read in the Bible, but I can still call them brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's just an amazing thing to think about as we move forward and as we look towards the next life. Now, the last thing, uh, just in closing, thinking about a, a very uh, powerful story that I heard as a boy from my dad was uh, about what it means to show grace to someone. So when I was a kid, my dad taught me the lesson of grace this way. There once was a man who was living in the homosexual lifestyle, and he had come to Christ. He, he had guys come and witness to him and share him the good news of Christ. He became a Christian, and these guys were into uh, hunting. And they decided, we're going to take this young man out, and we're going to show him how to duck hunt. So he goes out, and he's got a shotgun in his hand. And, and um, so they're going out, and all of a sudden he goes, and a bird flies up. And of course, you've got to uh, shoot at the bird, but there's guys around you, so it's kind of a dangerous type of sport. And he goes and goes to shoot the bird, and he misfires the gun, and it was uh, just shot the ground. But it was still something that would be dangerous. And this man had come from a lifestyle where he believed that, that men were going to condemn him. He grew up thinking that people were looking down on him, and he lived this way. And he expected these men to jeer at him and, and mock him and uh, not love him. But you know what? This is the beauty of it. These guys who are brothers in Christ, they said, Instead of doing what he thought they were going to do, what he was so used to, they said, we are so sorry. We should have taught you better. We should have been more careful with the way that we, we just let you do this. You know, we, we're really, we messed up. And the reason that taught me grace is because, you know what, they didn't think they were better than him. And it was the exact thing that he needed to hear. And the thing is, those guys weren't doing it because they just were intelligent or they, they knew the right words was because God was working in their hearts and he wanted that message that he loves that young man that they brought in. That was the message. And so my challenge is, is and I see this in this church, people who are un kind enough to say hello to each other, to greet each other, is my challenge this week is pick one person in your life that you know and 
pray for them, get to know them better. And I'm giving that to myself because I'm kind of a kind of a, a boxy kind of guy and I like my space, but but looking at all this, I can't but think that if grace is real in my life, then it should be reflecting to others. So that being said, that's all I have. So let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, there are so many examples of grace in the Bible. We think um, we read it all the time, Lord, and, and uh, are inspired, Lord. But let it be made manifest, Lord. May your light shine through us. That grace isn't a word that we need to speak, but only seen by so many, Lord. That uh, what people see as a difference in us, Lord, we can say that's just God's grace. Lord, thank you so much for what your son did on the cross and off the cross, Lord that he is here with us now, and that you love us in spite of our failings. In your name, Lord, thank you so much for everybody coming here tonight, Lord, and for us to see your truth in your word. In your name, amen. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Jamesville Athletic Club.